If you enjoy this video, consider supporting us on Patreon for just $5 a month. Click on the card in the upper right hand corner for more information. Hey guys, this is Julian of Julian Gray Media. Today we are going to take a look inside of the project of my brand new remix of Matt Fax's incredible song with Ava Silver, The Wave. This song is out now on Enhanced Music's Colorize imprint and you can go and stream it in the upper right hand corner right now. You also can find that link in the description of the video below. So when I heard this record on Matt Fax's newest album, I'm referring to the original of course, I fell in love with it instantly and I reached out to the guys over at Enhance. They're great friends of mine from my work with Deza, notably Cold Outside. But yeah, when I heard the record, I reached out to Enhance and Matt Fax and his team Matt's kind of been a friend of mine for a few years now. We've been working on some stuff, uh, you know, collaborative for quite a while. We're a big fan of each other's music. And um, I said, can I get the stem to this song? Enhanced got him over to me immediately. And this, like my last remix that I did a video on last week, um, the remix of Atlas's song, Half Light, I turned this remix around probably in three to four days while I was on a mini vacation, quarantine, pseudo vacation slash um, isolation over in Maryland with my family. If you want to find out more about that, click on the link in the upper right hand corner right now to check out my video on my remix of Half Light by Atlas. But like that remix, this remix I turned around incredibly fast as well so the project file isn't super cumbersome, the video shouldn't be too long today, so let's hop into it and get started. One thing to note before we get started, I just released my brand new Gradient Volume 2 record. If you haven't heard of Gradient, it's my arts collective where I promote smaller artists and incredible creative people uh, of all different types of art and creativity. Our annual arts compilation, Colors Volume 2, just launched this last week. We're doing extremely well on Beatport. Uh, number one across several genres and almost to the top 50 overall. Make sure to go and support the artists at Gradient down in the link below. I think we can chart even higher with your support and I'm sure all the Gradient creatives that put their hard work and effort into this thing um, would really appreciate that. We also have a physical CD coming soon, like with Volume 1, if you're familiar with that. Uh, our creative team's really knocked it out of the park with those and I'm so excited to get those out to you guys. But without any further ado, let's jump right into the video. Awesome guys, so this is the project file for my remix of The Wave by Matt Fax and Ava Silver. Um, it's not too complicated as you can see here, it's 50 channels. Like most of my music, there's a lot of parallels to my previous project files, so I'm gonna try to avoid you know, being redundant with a lot of the things in this video that I did cover in my last video, my Atlas remix. Again, if you want to check that out, the link is in the description. But a lot of the stuff that I do sound design wise and a lot of my workflow techniques are covered in that video and a lot of my previous Inside the Project videos. If you want to check out my Inside the Project video playlist, go ahead and click on the link in the upper right hand corner right now and you can check out all of them. I do one of these for all of my like core songs, the ones that do really well, so you can go check that out. But anyway, let's hop into the project file here. Um, like I've discussed in previous videos, I use these MIDI clips at the top of my arrangements to sort out how things are you know, laid out musically, but in a visual way. I, I like to be able to see where my verse, my breakdown, my build up, my drops, etc. start in a visual way at first glance. I don't like to look at clips like this and kind of guess. A lot of people like to do this with locators as well, like this, but then I see all these vertical lines and it, I feel it gets very messy. So I don't like to do that. I like to break it down with some MIDI clips like this so that you can really see what everything is. And then I have uh, a mix version up top here and one, at, one right here as well. So the purpose of this is so I can click on it, press Command L or Control L on Windows, and just be able to loop the entire version of the mix. I like to do both of my mixes in the same project file. So if I make a minor adjustment to like, let's say a mixing thing like volume, pan, um, some sort of VST effect or something, it carries over between the original mix and the extended mix. And I always do this late game in the project so that I don't have to make any major corrections or copy automation from here to here. But yeah, so that's that. These first two channels are just purely uh, visual 
uh, indicators of where things are triggering throughout the song. Okay, those guys are done. We'll go ahead and take these look, take a look at this guy from the top to bottom here. I usually do this by looking at key important pieces, but I feel like we probably get through it easier and I make sure not to miss anything by going from top to bottom. Really simple stuff, guys. A clap on the, the upbeats. Uh, we have a Matt Lang clap in here. Uh, incredible musician Matt Lang is. Uh, I did a remix for him recently, and he's also featured on our new Gradient uh, compilation. You can go and check that out again at the link in the description. Um, a little bit of a high pass curve here to give some crunch to the high hat or to the clap rather. I always favor my highs and my claps because it really brings out the presence and clarity. That crispness of a really good clap is exemplified by boosting the top end. And then it's side chain slightly to our kick drum so that it's in a way transient shaping the clap. We're letting the end of the clap get trimmed off by the, the, by the kick itself. Okay, um, we have a hi-hat, uh, Matt Lang again. You can look at the effects chain here. Um, Go ahead and do this for you, so you can see everything. Rather than explain this stuff, because I, I explain it in every video, um, I'm sure that you guys are sick of hearing boost the high end for clarity. Um, I sweep out some of the the lows to you know signify transitions and stuff like that. Um, you can check that out in any of my videos, really. Here's some top drums. These are from the original song. And I only really use these in the intro and the build-up sections, as you can see here. If I if I play this here, you can hear how it's like. Um, it's because we have a resonant frequency of the auto filter kind of sweeping down. It's almost like a 303 effect, but on something like percussion, you end up with this really cool, exaggerated, resonant tone. Uh, as it sweeps down, it it really creates a, a cool effect for things like drum sweeps, um, build up drums, and stuff like that. I use it a lot in my like 909 snare build ups right before a drop. Like, um, it's what creates that really ravey build up drum feeling. Yeah, a little bit of reverb, a little bit of compression to flatten out some of the dynamics of the reverb, and we have that filter there. Not hard stuff. That's one of the few things I use from the original song is these top drums. You'll find a lot of parallels to my Atlas remix in that regard, and a lot of my remixes. Uh, I usually grab one to like maybe five elements from the original song if they're available, and I'll work off of those. And then largely the production is pretty new. I always like to try to relate it back to the original song instead of trying to fully reinvent the song. I think that the duty of a remixer is to take the original song's vision and just paint it in your own way. It's not to take a painting, pull one little corner of it, and then paint an entire new picture. I think it's more of like you take the same subject matter that the painter painted and you paint it in a slightly different light. When people just rip the vocal out and just remix that, it almost feels like they're taking a painting and then, you know, exacto blading out a little square out of the middle and then building a entirely new canvas behind it, which is cool in some regards um, for some people. But for me, it feels a little bit disingenuous to the original vision of the song. So I always like to relate it back in a way. So yeah, so there's these top drums here. We have a uh, filter sweep again, doing a resonant tone to create some interest. That's a lot more interesting than, let's say, this. This is more akin to like a volume sound when, or a volume change. Uh, if you listen to, you know, a, a no resonance filter sweep, it can almost be perceived as like a change in volume, similar to how like a low pass filter can be perceived in a way as a volume change instead of like a major change of tone. Uh, doing a sweep like this without a resonant uh, frequency can also have that same effect. Okay, so those are the top hats. Uh, we're getting through this thing pretty quick actually here. Um, we have my hat, which is just a sample from Leviathan. Again, Black Octopus, I always use their stuff. It's incredible samples. You can check out my link 
you can check out the link to my review of their most recent pack, Leviathan 3, up in the upper right-hand corner right now. And yeah, I have a high boost just to bring out some clarity. Again, a sweep, a uh, little bit of delay. Create some stereo imaging effects that feels like the hi-hat is bouncing around instead of just playing it flat. Okay, and then we have a 16th note hi-hat too, just to really fill out the space in between that previous hi-hat. And this guy is just a you know 16th note hi-hat being blasted through an OTT, a little bit of boost. Side chain to the kick, so we have a little bit of motion, and then we have an auto pan giving it some spatial depth within the stereo image. Okay, we have some minor effects on this guy. I think these are from Matt's original song. As you can hear, these big like, you know, like a, like a mallet in the rain at a far distance kind of sound. Blue man group type of mallet sound. I love that. I use that actually quite a bit. He actually didn't use it this much in the original song. I just really liked it. I think I used a different key right there. I changed it, transposed it. Yeah. It's had a little bit different of a feeling the second time as if it was hit up top and then it kind of hit lower so we can signify this change of tone and, and you know, the, the difference of sections. Honestly, this should have been a different color. I think this is a build-up effect that Matt had in his original song. And then we have some minor other stuff too. We have this rain stick sound from Cymatics that I used for some of the transitionary parts. This kind of fills up that background really nicely. Um, when she says sinking down in a sea of lies or like following the wave, I wanted to kind of insinuate that water feeling, the the feeling of the water kind of flowing around. And I think that rain sticks and things like that really convey that. In my song Touch, which you can check out the inside the project of in that aforementioned playlist, um, I actually used a lot of water sounds. I used like bubbles and rain sticks and stuff like that because the song's theme was drowning in your love and this is kind of a uh, callback to that in a way. Okay, and as for processing on that, you can take a look quickly. It's not too much, just some reverb and delay, you know, with minor compression and stuff. I actually muted it out for that one little dramatic break right before the drop. Full break, I didn't want the delay tail to go off any further than that. Okay, we have our kick drum, Matt Fax uh, kick drum. Okay, it's an original kick drum. I have a gain boost on it, and I have R bass from my friends at Waves. R bass is a really cool plugin that lets you essentially fake low end on smaller speakers. What it does is it exemplifies higher harmonics of your of your low fundamental. So if you have a sub or like a bass that's hitting the fundamental frequency that's like below the roll off curve of your monitors because every speaker has like a, a lowest point it can reach. I'm sure you're familiar with that, like your phone can't produce sub bass. Um, let's say that your, your kick sub frequency, your fundamental of your kick is hitting lower than that. Every uh, frequency has multiplicative harmonics. So like if you have like a uh, 440 and 880 as the octave of it, um, that's the A. Um, so what it does is it takes those, uh, I guess, those doubled up harmonics up the up the the frequency spectrum i guess and it boosts the resonant harmonics of the sound instead of just relying on that main harmonic so you end up with this really uh i guess fuller sounding bass on smaller speakers that can't produce that super low end that's at least my understanding of how our bass works i would encourage you to look up like an actual official readout of our bass that could be absolutely inaccurate to how it exactly works. I'm fairly confident though 
that that's largely uh, the mechanism that it works off of because it's how they do that for a lot of like smaller speakers that produce sub, for example. So I have a little bit of our bass doing a 53 frequency. And then we have a uh, kick two, not kick two the plugin, but kick two a channel with a kick sample with some uh, high passing because I just wanted to click off of it. Yeah, and together you get this nice sharp kick. Okay, we have a crash sound, very self-explanatory. So rather than doing like a quarter note or a 16th or something like that, we're actually following the pattern of the bass, which is the next level below it. I just wanted to do that to exaggerate those bass hits a little bit more. So instead of just having the bass go like dun, 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 we have the, the crash over it, which just creates this really like harsh, like bam, 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 with a psh, 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 psh. It's kind of like what they do in like metal where they hit the crash on the same beat as the kick and the bass player at the same time. Really, really like hard and, and strong. And that actually brings us to our next part. I'll actually look at this guy next. I just wanna look at the bass really quick so I can show you. So these two basses are actually the original basses, my fault. These are actually not used in the song, neither is this. The real bass is actually down here. Um, and these are just chopped up bits of the original bass, which I can play for you really quickly here. I'm sure there's pieces of that you recognize. And then there's this guy too. So the bass was generated with this filter here. I'm sweeping the, the frequency with a major resonant sound at the top. And it's really creating this bouncy, like low end thing. I don't know how to describe it. And it's going through some delay too. And you can kind of see it there. And then I took pieces of both of these bases and then I layered them together here in this guy. And if we go layer by layer here, we have this top one. This is actually just a synth doing a saw wave pluck. Little boost in the mids here with a transient shaper to make it extra hard. Extra attack at the beginning and then fades off slowly at the end. Then we have a bass here. Uh, this is, uh, again, one of these resampled basses from before. Going through our bass, high pass curve, chorus, OTT, Roth Air for some sharpness and then a transient shaper to make it really, really percussive in a way, really strong and, and um, attack heavy. And then we have uh, a sub, which is obvious. We have a sign and we have a triangle wave with a little bit of uh, filter motion here to reveal some top end, but it doesn't get very far after it hits this EQ right here. Transient Shaper, again, to make that really smack. So it has that really strong attack and then it fades out really quickly. And our bass, again, to boost some of the low end frequencies. White Noise is essentially doing the same thing as that aforementioned crash. And then it's just presenting the groove. And then we have a sub bass, which is, you know, a sub bass. This one is doing a 16th note chug on the volume of both of these both of these oscillators at the same time, and it's creating that really strong like movement in the low end. And that's all of our main bases. I'll let you take a look at the, the bass uh, group here. All of the high ends are doing a little bit of delay as well, so we get a, a little bit bouncy of a feeling. You hear those little nuances in there? It really fills up the space of the top of the bass. You don't want to do this to your sub sub, like way down here at like, you know, 80 hertz and below, but I think in the upper echelon of the, you know, lower mids, you end up with this really cool bouncy sound if you fill it up with some delay. Cool, and then we can reintroduce those subs. And that sounds cool as it is, that really sharp, like, FME sound, but 
uh, it's really brought to the next level when you introduce these counter melody bass sounds like this. And these are actually direct copies of the um, the source bass that I just ran through an OTT and a little bit of processing here. <laughs> I believe this might have been through that aforementioned filtered version, this guy. That's why it has so much of the resonance there. And again, a little bit of delay. You get this really cool chuggy bass sound. Then this whole thing is going through some LFO tool and some minor processing here just to shape up the sound. And we end up with this really awesome chuggy bass sound. Really sharp curve in the LFO tool as well, just to um, you know get it out of the way of the kick and then bring it back right as soon as the kick's out of the way. Okay, um, and then we have this big hit here, which is another layer. It's kind of like a Julian Gray signature big re-saw hit. That's just a saw wave. Two saw waves with some low pass movement on a low pass 12 with some distortion. Then we have some reverb as well. Yeah, some side chain, a little bit of uh, filter movement in some places. Doesn't seem to be doing much actually. Um, sometimes there ends up with this like redundant filters and stuff that I forget to remove. I think this is the case of one of those. And then we have a little bit of EQ here as well just to shape up the sound. All right, so in between these bass sounds, we have these guys here. Weird structure, I know. This should actually probably be like here, but it is what it is. We have these guys here, which are, this one's disabled, so it's actually not on, but we do have these chords, which hit in the, I think the breakdowns. Yeah. You're familiar with this, of course. This is just an odd voicing of a standard chord. As you can see here, this is just a regular triad. Um, this one shifts up to the, the top note here. Uh, I think that's an octave actually. But uh, it's just a, a odd voicing of a triad. I think it's the second inversion. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it is. Again, I'm not positive of this. I actually had a similar epiphany in the last video. Another day has gone away. Oh. Cool, midis in place, and the sound design, as usual, is just a big saw wave, a little bit of white noise, and a cutoff filter doing some very organic automation, actually. Day has gone you can see it here. I'll actually do this for you. And it's kind of going in and out like the water at the ocean goes in and out. It's like and you'll, you'll notice that. Like the waves. And that, that dramatic gap that everyone loves. Start descending those notes here, um, then start climbing again, and then we hit another descending here. And some basic processing on here, reverb, delay, high pass into the, the breakdowns, or into the buildups. And in addition to that, in this buildup section, we have some strings. 
That's Spitfire Lab Strings Ensemble. Holding that note out really creates this tension right before the drop. In the song, it sounds like this. Introduce that high harmonic there. And there's a gap. And then the drop kicks in. Okay, and then we have this lead sound here, which is like signature Julian Gray counter melody stuff. And the sound design is really, really simple. Just a sine wave with a filter on it, some reverb and some delay. I plan on doing a video soon about writing melodies. I think that would help a lot of you guys. These sort of melodies, I think, really help paint the picture of the song. Uh, they convey the story a lot more than just, you know, the regular chord progression. And then we have some build up stuff here like these snares, really easy stuff like I said before, just a 909 snare rolling at a 16th note. We have a little bit of filter movement here with a resonance to create some tension. Moving uh, auto filter amount and rate so that it feels like it's kind of drifting around you. Oops. And then we kind of bring it to the center towards the end there. Um, to accentuate that, we also have a clap, which is the 909 clap. High boost and a sweep on the filter as well. I think it's exactly the same actually. Then the sub for the, the breakdown sections, really, really simple. It's just the same MIDI as before, just the root note. And then we have just a saw wave and a sine wave doing a octave zero with a filter on it. It just fills out the low end nicely. Here's the chords. There's not quite as much filter movement on this guy as there was on the other one, like the wave movement, but it still has a little bit. Okay, and then we have the vocals here at the end. I think this is actually all of it. I have a few of these reversed vocal sounds that I use throughout. It's like reversed of the first syllable of the running into itself, then we end up with running with a little bit of echo. That's how we start the song and then we filter it up with that, that auto filter, bring it in slowly. By the end, you can really make out the word running. It feels like they're fading in from the distance, and I think it has a nice storytelling element to it. Um, and then obviously you have your vocal, largely unchanged from the original. I kind of just dropped it in. I have a little bit of reverb automation on parts of it, like the buildup. Same for the delay. Here they're kind of coming in, they're cascading on one another, like the waves at the beach or whatever. Uh, the vocals are kind of coming in and laying over top of each other. I have this vocal at the end of the phrase to really bring it back around.
Very cool. So we've covered that. Um, we have these vocal textures, which are basically just pieces of the vocal that I repeat over and over. So it ends up with this really cool like texture feel. I do section a lot of my music just to fill out the space a little bit. I'll grab a syllable, I'll stretch it out um, and make a pad out of it like this. And then oftentimes, as you can see here, I'll take a second version of that and transpose it. So I build a kind of pseudo chord out of two independent layers. You get this really nice harmonic feeling. It's very quiet and subtle, but it's so nice. Cool, uh, we have these vocals here. I don't think I actually use this. This is what I use to generate the source reversed vocals. Essentially, you take a syllable, flip it over, add reverb, flatten it to, to audio, as you can see here, and then flip it again, and then you end up with a reversed vocal into vocal, as you can see from this. And it's what really sells off those really cool intros to the vocal sections. Yeah. There's a few other places I use a different channel. This is like the harmony stuff, which I used. I'm sorry, this is the harmony stuff. Or maybe there isn't harmony stuff. These are just other places I use the vocal. This is like a run that I used in the drop. And then I have this guy, which is just another layer of the vocal. I think the only reason I did this is because I wanted to lay this on top of this one as it ended, so. Yeah, and you can't usually do that if you have to, you know, accommodate them both on one channel. And then I have this uh, last part, which is this vocal chop thing. which is just a syllable from the vocal, as you can see here, um, that I've dragged in and I'm just playing it really quickly with some pretty aggressive processing, actually, uh, mostly OTT, reverb, and delay uh, with a little bit of compression to flatten out some of the dynamics of these guys. And then side-chained, and then uh, obviously the filter for transitionary stuff and just overall dynamics of the vocal to keep it interesting. I turned it up and down at some points. Uh, it's very uncommon for me to do that, but I do. As you can see here. And I'm just kind of hitting the, the, I guess that's a dotted, dotted eighth note, I guess. Yeah. I keep hitting the dotted eighth note. The, the note doesn't last a full dotted eighth it kind of only lingers on for an eighth note but then I trigger on the dotted eighth grid here and I end up with this really cool groove really quick look at the master I have um, ozone on this really quick look on the master I actually didn't do the mastering on this guy so there's not much to see here I just have a little bit of a high boost overall just to give the thing a, a a kick before it hits the master limiter, which I actually don't use because Enhanced handled the mastering on this guy. And then I have a little bit of gain automation here, as you can see. In some places, I'll turn the, the entire mix down a few decibels, maybe up to three, just so I can create a little bit of dynamic between my breakdowns and my drops in terms of volume. A lot of your energy is carried in volume um, so just turning something down really quickly before you hit that drop can really exaggerate the feeling of the drop. Also, a lot of times you'll see if you look on like a device like Span, um, you end up with a really loud buildup because it's so energetic. There's so many things going on. And if you're in techno or progressive or what have you, and you drop it a little bit more minimal, a lot of times the drop feels underwhelming and you can get around that just by turning the entire buildup down because a lot of times that's just the problem. You have so many things congested into one section in your buildup that are, that are you know, very high energy. You end up with this really loud section and then you're actually objectively and audibly 
turning down the volume when you hit your drop. So make sure that the dynamic is always that your breakdown is quieter and your drop is louder. Um, and that'll always help your energy transmission. I don't know how many student songs and how many like fix your project songs I fixed just based on turning down the, the build up and turning up the drop or leaving the drop where it was and just cranking the limiter a little bit more. So that is the entire project file for my remix of Matt Fax and Ava Silver's The Wave. Incredible song. I loved remixing this song. And let me know what you think of my remix and the original down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like and make sure to subscribe for future videos. I think I'm going to do a video on my brand new record with Blind Spider called Likely Los Angeles. It was my song from the recent Gradient Colors Volume 2 record. If you're interested in that, let me know down in the comment section below and we'll get to that video very soon. Thank you for watching as always guys. I am Julian of Julian Gray Media and I will talk to you in the next one. Bye-bye.